Hello, Practical Alchemists. Welcome back. So honored that you're here. So excited to be diving into today's conversation. I am so excited to sit down with today's guest. So much wisdom that is going to come forth. I'm a big fan of her body of work. And today I have the pleasure of sitting down with Anjali Deva, who is an Ayurvedic practitioner currently residing in the mountains of Southern California. She has a private practice called Rooted Rasa that specializes in an integrative and trauma-informed approach to Ayurveda. Anjali also founded Madhya Way, which is a school for Ayurveda founded in 2020 to provide education in trauma-informed care. She's also the co-author of From Stressed Out to Wise to Stress Wise, published in July of 2023. And she's dedicated to sharing the wisdom of Ayurveda for the benefit of all living beings. And so thank you so much for being here today, Anjali. How are you feeling? Thank you. I'm excited. I'm happy to chat about Ayurveda and chat with you. Thank you for the opportunity. Of course. And we always start the podcast just by taking a breath. I feel like with all of the to-dos, we're constantly taking in information. It's nice to just take a pause. And so if you would like, we can take a moment to just close the eyes and just take a deep breath into the belly through the nose. Hmm. Beautiful. Thank you so much for indulging me in that moment. (laughs) And so, you know, I really would love to start with your story. I always am so intrigued when people's dharma seems to be so deeply rooted in something that shaped them from childhood or from a parent. And I would love to hear how you came to find Ayurveda, how Ayurveda came to find you. I think I read that it's been a part of your life in a way through a parent, but would love to hear your story. Yeah, you're right. So Ayurveda found me through both of my parents, but primarily my dad. My dad is an Ayurvedic doctor, so I grew up with it in his household. My parents were divorced, and both my parents are Indian, and I think Ayurveda is kind of woven into many Indian households. So my mom practiced a lot of like folk remedies and kitchen remedies and using food as medicine. So even though it was never really called Ayurveda, it was very much a part of my life. And then I was like a typical American teen who wanted to rebel and party and do all the things that all my friends were doing. And my very sensitive constitution just couldn't handle it. Mm. So I found myself in my early 20s, I think similar to your story, kind of just burnt out, exhausted, tired, sick, really unwell in so many different ways. So I went back to my dad and told him that I was going to study Ayurveda. (laughs) I was just going to drop out of college and enroll in Ayurveda school. And he really cautioned me against that (laughs) and was a little bit like, you know, slow your roll. Like if you're going to commit to Ayurveda, it's a lifelong commitment and you need to really know that this is what you're doing. So I read a few books. I took some time to really sit with it. And I think the next semester I did do that. I dropped out of college and I enrolled in Ayurveda school and formally took on the study of Ayurveda, which was beautiful and challenging in a lot of ways. And after graduating from Ayurveda school, I went to India and studied with some doctors there, Mm -hmm. learned about panchakarma, detoxification, And when I came back, I started my practice within an integrative psychiatry clinic. My focus has always been on mental health because my mom was an addict. So I grew up in a household with a lot of trauma, a lot of instability, a lot of hardship, and that weighed on me and my own mental health. Mm -hmm. So it sort of came full circle of being able to apply Ayurveda specifically for mental health. Wow. That's such a beautiful story. And also I can totally relate of like growing up first generation, growing up wanting to fit in and also all of the layers that come with that aspect of the psyche of wanting to fit in, wanting to be like everybody else. And it's so poetic that everything kind of led you back to your roots and even your ancestral roots, ancestors not too far removed, like one generation removed. And so 
you know, I, I would love to hear about the moment of kind of when you realized that you needed something to help because you were having these symptoms, these conditions, what was showing up for you physically that you really felt like, okay, this isn't right. Something's wrong. Something's off. Something's off balance. And I need to find a way to recalibrate. Yeah, of course, it was many things at once, but it was sort of this overlap, which I see a lot in my practice now, of digestive health, anxiety, and then hormonal health. So my face was covered in eczema and it would flare every time I got my cycle. Anything I ate would just like bloat and upset my stomach. And I was an anxious, just wreck, like panic attacks all the time. Mm. So it was this layer of many things and no doctor could tell me why they were interrelated, you know? And I just had this gut feeling of like, all my symptoms seem to flare around the same time and around the same thing. So they have to be connected. There's no way that like it's just stress. So I found myself just wanting to understand like the connection between what we're eating and how that affects our mood and how our mood affects our hormones and just that kind of cyclical map, I guess. Yeah. And so for those listening who maybe have heard about Ayurveda, don't know much about the science, really what in short definition, because I know that Ayurveda is also such an ancient tradition and medicine. And so it's layered and you could probably talk for hours just sharing about the definition of Ayurveda. But for somebody who's never heard of it or someone who's not too familiar with it, what is Ayurveda? Yeah. Ayurveda is a form of traditional medicine from Southeast Asia, specifically the Indian subcontinent. And it's a holistic mind, body, spirit form of medicine that is really rooted in digestive health, herbal remedies, the importance of the mind-body connection. And in the West, it's really practiced as preventative medicine. So we think a lot about how our food is impacting our health, how our lifestyle is affecting our health, how our daily rhythms is affecting our health. And like you said, it's very ancient. We know it to be at least 5,000 years old, probably longer. And so it's really multifaceted. In India, it's practiced a little bit differently where you would go and see a Vaidya or a wise man or a doctor who, you know, just by looking at your pulse can tell you a lot about yourself. Here in the West, we've kind of systematized it into like diet, practice, lifestyle, practice, meditation, yoga, herbs, all of these different modalities that can help us come back into balance when we find that we are off course. Life kind of threw us off course for whatever reason. Mm -hmm. And one of the main philosophies of Ayurveda is called the doshas, which has to do with our constitution. And our belief in Ayurveda is that every single person has an individual constitution that's rooted in the five elements. So depending on how those elements are functioning or dysfunctioning in your your body, it could show up as different levels of balance or imbalance. Yeah, the constitution piece, I think, is the one that I'm most familiar with, with Ayurveda. But to your point, it's such an ancient tradition, practice, and medicine, and it's so layered. It's so much deeper than the surface level that we get exposed to in the West but at least we get exposure to it to some degree, right? And so I would love to hear a little bit about each dosha, if you don't mind sharing, because I think it's always so interesting when people hear and they're like, oh yeah, that resonates. And that is when I feel imbalanced. And I think it's so empowering also when you learn about your own doshas to learn that bringing the dosha back into balance is really not that difficult. It's just maybe counterintuitive to how modern life expects us to operate. Would you say that's true? Yeah. Yeah, for sure. I mean, I think one of the things that we say in Ayurveda is when you're out of balance, you crave what keeps you out of balance. And so I I interpret that as meaning like when we are in a state of survival, we're just going to make the decisions based on what's helping us to survive. And often, like you said, that's kind of counterintuitive to what we actually need on a deeper level. But yeah, I can talk a little bit about the doshas. So when I teach the doshas to 
kids, like high schoolers, I usually introduce them as animals. I feel like it's really accessible. So maybe we'll use that kind of to talk about them today. So the first is called Vata. And this is a constitution that is a combination of space and air. And I think about Vata as the butterfly. So this tends to be a person who has a thinner body frame, who moves quickly, thinks quickly, talks quickly, has a lot of creative, effervescent, light energy to them. They tend to have a smaller body frame with prominent bones. They have some irregularity to them. Mm. And when they go out of balance, vatas tend to be like a butterfly that drank way too much coffee and forgot to eat. <laughs> you know, it's like that really anxious, frenetic, like awake too late, full of energy, can't stop, like nervous kind of feeling. And that often shows up in the digestive system as like constipation, gas, bloating, and other physical symptoms would be like dry skin. Mentally, we'd see maybe some fear or insecurity. Whereas the second dosha, pitta, is more like a tiger. So this is a combination of fire and water. And it tends to be people who have a lot of fire. So they have a lot of drive. They have a lot of motivation. They have a lot of inspiration and forward-moving momentum. Mm. They tend to run warm. They tend to have a more moderate height and weight, more of an athletic body. And like a tiger that's gone too long without eating, they can get really hangry. <laughs> they can get road rage. <laughs> they can kind of tip over into this place of being too hot. Mm. And so when that heat becomes excessive in the body, we'll see that in the digestive system as a constitution that might have frequent or loose stools, maybe some heartburn, acidity. We might see heat on the skin like rashes. And mentally, we're going to see irritability, frustration, impatience, and the kind of heated emotions that we associate with pitta. And kapha, our third dosha, is like a sweet baby elephant. It's like <laughs> slow moving, methodical, joyful, calm, just really kind of in a good calm flow. And kaphas tend to be very hardworking, very sincere, very empathic. They tend to have bigger body frames. They take up more space. They are also cool like vata, but they're cold and kind of moist, maybe more clammy, whereas vata tends to be dry. They're more slow moving and methodical. And when they go out of balance, it's like everything slows down. So like a baby elephant that lost its herd and it looks around just in fear and kind of freezes. So when we think about that in the digestive system, it's like a slowing down of the metabolism, usually some weight gain, some indigestion. It can show up on the skin as like acne or oiliness. And then mentally, we see a lot of imbalance that has to do with lethargy, lack of motivation, dullness, even depression can fall under this. And so in Ayurveda, we all have all three, but we have like different amounts of them. And we can be predominant in one. We can be out of balance in another. Our constitution is dynamic in the sense that it's always changing. And based on the season or how much stress you're under or what you're eating, your doshas can go out of balance in different ways. Mm, it's so fascinating. And you're so right. We all have a little bit of each one because each one I was like, yes, I've seen myself lean into that or, or have an uh, imbalance of that in some seasons of life. And I, I love that integrating food and herbs as medicine seems to be such a cornerstone of your practice. And so could you share some examples or even just some ways in which how specific dietary changes or herbs Ayurvedic foods can address common health imbalances, at least what you see with your clients, with yourself? Yeah, for sure. So it's something like 70% of Americans experience a digestive disorder, like a functional digestive disorder where, yeah, <laughs> like there's constipation, there's glass, there's bloating, there's loose stools, like everyone has got something going on. And in Ayurveda, that's kind of our first indication that the doshas are out of balance. So one of the primary ways that we look at that and one of the simplest ways that we look at that is to think about foods that are heating or cooling. 
So an example would be like a bell pepper versus a cucumber. We all kind of inherently know what's going to be more cooling for our body and what's going to be more warming. So depending on how your body goes out of balance, we would choose herbs and foods that support those qualities of the dosha that are out of balance. So for example, if you're a vata type of person and you're anxious and you're forgetting to eat and you're stressed out and you're not sleeping well and you're a bit constipated, eating foods that are really cold and dry, like salads, might not be the best food for you. Switching to something that's more like a soup or a stew with warming spices like ginger and turmeric can be really supportive for increasing the diversity in your microbiome or in Ayurveda, we would say stoking your Agni, waking up your digestive fire Mm -hmm. so that we can have greater health. You know, our gut impacts every single system in our body. Mm -hmm. Yeah, stoking the Agni. I remember learning about that in my 200-hour yoga teacher training. And it's true. It's like the salad culture of like eating healthy. It's like it doesn't always work for everybody. And so I love how you can incorporate foods that we intuitively know, right? We know what's warming. We know what's cooling. And so, yeah, I love how practical that is. And if people want to learn more, I know that you share a lot of blog posts on your website. And I want to pivot a little bit because I am so curious about your practice. Rooted Rasa, it's such a beautiful offering. And I am curious because you focus on an integrative and trauma-informed approach to Ayurveda, which is so beautiful and so needed. And I don't hear that a lot in the spaces, right? I don't hear trauma-informed Ayurveda be a, a very common form of practice. And so, yeah, I would love to hear how your practice differs, what this means to you being a trauma-informed approach practice yeah. and how it differs from perhaps more traditional approaches or approaches that are not focused on trauma-informed. Mm-hmm. Yeah, great question. You know, I think a lot about that, especially because trauma-informed has become such a buzzword. Mm -hmm. But I think when I really sit with it, yoga and Ayurveda are how people have healed trauma for thousands of years. It is an ancient modality that's been used to heal trauma. And so one of the things that was really hard for me going to Ayurveda school was I was up against all this trauma from my childhood. Mm -hmm. And then I got essentially like a rule book of everything that I was doing wrong. (laughs) You know, Ayurveda was like, you're eating wrong. You're going to bed at the wrong time. You're taking the wrong herbs. Like you're not meditating enough. There was just this long to-do list of things that I really wanted so desperately to change about my life. And I could maybe like for a week or two make those changes. And then something would happen. I would get triggered and I would fall back into old patterns. And So for me, trauma-informed means understanding why we are in those protective mechanisms, why we make the choices that we make, like why eating pizza when you're stressed, even though you know you shouldn't, is the thing that you do. And so, so much of Ayurveda is helping us to unpack, like, why do we override our voice of wisdom? And I think a lot of that, in my opinion, has to do with really slowing down the process Mm -hmm. of how we make change and not using Ayurveda as a to-do list or a checklist of more things to stress yourself out with, but to really get to the core of like, how do we find safety? How do we find joy? How do we make food and herbs and your lifestyle a joyful practice? And to acknowledge that our past experiences do impact who we are today, you know, and as much as we want to just like erase everything from the past and wake up and be a different person, sometimes we have to face difficult emotions. And that takes time. Yeah, I think you said it in this world of healing and this world of wellness. It's a beautiful and worthy pursuit. And it's also so easy to slip into the state of mind of now we have this massive to-do list on top of the heaviness an emotion that we're feeling, now we also feel like we have to climb this impossible mountain to get to where we're headed, right? And so I love that your approach is focused more on how can we make this joyful? Because that's how we're really going to stick to things, isn't it? Like by making things enjoyable, by making things pleasurable rather than this long to-do list. 
Absolutely. Yeah. And, you know, when we look at trauma and the groups of folks who are affected by trauma, more likely minority groups, we haven't been taught to prioritize our joy, to prioritize our self-care, to prioritize our liberation. Like we've just been taught to survive, you know? And so I think it's just so important for us, especially those of us who are in minority groups to really think about like this revolutionary act of being joyful. I just want to like give that statement a moment and some spaciousness because it feels so good to hear. And thank you for bringing that into the conversation. I think it's layered when people have different life experience that creates barriers of access that have nothing to do with financial, have nothing to do with geographical. It's more so these mental blocks that have been passed down from generation through to generation from oppression or belonging to different groups that have been oppressed historically or haven't had the, honestly, the privilege to focus on what makes them joyful, what makes us feel fulfilled because we're focused on surviving, right? Yeah. Yeah, totally. And so I think, you know, trauma informed also means like when you're sitting in a room with someone taking in their socioeconomic status, their family history, the way in which they view themselves, because not everybody has access to like 100% organic, locally grown food. Mm -hmm. And that's a reality that we have to live with. And I think, you know, we do the best that we can and we meet people where they are and adding more shame onto whatever it is that we're already experiencing is not healing. That's not our intention. Mm. And it's so clear that this is such a big passion of yours within your work. If you know me, you know I am all about reconnecting with the earth, indigenous wisdom and teachings through plant allies and plant medicines. And that is why I am so honored and excited to share that today's episode sponsor is Four Visions. Four Visions is an organization who puts indigenous wisdom keepers at the forefront and brings medicines from the Amazon and the jungles to share with people all around the globe. And what I love about Four Visions is that secret reciprocity informs everything that they do. They have a beyond fair trade model that is designed to mutually benefit cultural sharing. And it was really designed to provide as a bridge for the indigenous wisdom keepers to remain at the forefront for both educational purposes and decision making as we navigate these new waters of globalization of plant medicines. And when it comes to plant medicines, one of my absolute favorite allies is Hape. They have one of the best Hape apothecaries and Hape is a very sacred herbal snuff made by the indigenous tribes of the Amazon. And this is used as a healing snuff by traditional peoples to cleanse the mind, purify the thoughts, bring clarity, spiritual alignment, and clear negativity and heaviness from the body, mind, and soul. And today I am so excited to share with you a promo code that you can use at checkout out Natalie 15 for any of their products. They also have amazing tinctures, cacao, tea. So check them out for visions.com F O U R V I S I O N S.com and use code Natalie 15 N A T A L I E one five at checkout for 15% off. I would love to hear about Madhya Way, the school for Ayurveda, because I know that that is also with a big focus on trauma-informed care. What inspired you to create this educational platform? Yeah, yeah, great question. You know, I had been thinking about it all of 2019. And what really inspired me was I felt like there was no, and I still don't think there is any trauma-informed education in any of the Ayurveda schools in the United States. And that to me just felt like such a huge blind spot because the work that we do is so deep and holistic that there's no way you're not going to encounter somebody's trauma. There are so many practitioners who are graduating from Ayurveda school and have all this knowledge but don't know how to apply it you know, or have difficulty in applying it. So I really wanted to, one, provide professionals and graduating students with a skill set that was useful in the world, 
I also feel like Ayurveda is meant to be medicine of the people. Like it's supposed to help all of us heal. And if it's only in spaces where the majority of practitioners have a certain level of privilege and tend to be white bodied, you know, it's not accessing the rest of us, you know? I So I wanted to create a school where folks who might not feel like they are included in other realms, you feel comfortable and safe to come and study. So, you know, I really wanted to invite in like BIPOC folks, women, LGBTQ, survivors of trauma, just a variety of people who can really benefit from learning this for themselves and then be able to share it in their communities. Because I think there are so many simple and practical tools in Ayurveda that we can apply But if people, like, in my opinion, I'm clearly biased, but we should all learn this, like, really young. (laughs) Yeah, just just bringing it back to people being able to incorporate this and this being the medicine for the people, being able to, for somebody to feel empowered, to be able to implement and incorporate this into their lives. And I want to ask you about daily routine, because I know that Ayurveda emphasizes the importance of establishing daily routines. I believe that there is a word for it that I'm I'm going to let you share because I don't want to butcher it. But I feel like in the modern world, in modern life, sometimes it can feel intimidating to try and incorporate. It's like, okay, now I have like my one hour long morning routine. Now I have my one hour long bedtime routine. And like between that, my yoga, my meditation, which I love and I'm here for, but how can the listeners incorporate some of these practices into their lives in ways that are practical, that feel accessible from the lens point of it's not a big lift. It's simple, but impactful. Hmm. Yeah. Uh, great question. So the word is dinacharya, and it means daily routine, daily regimen. But I like daily ritual because to me that like just slight distinction between like a routine or a ritual, meaning that there's intention behind it, I think really just sets a different tone. And like we said, we can create a long to-do list of an hour-long thing that you can do in the morning. You know, but if we don't know what the intention is behind that and why you're doing what you're doing, it's really hard to get motivated to do that. So in Ayurveda, so much of our daily rituals are based on the time of day that the dosha is in charge of, you know, what practices are best for that time of day, following a circadian rhythm. And our morning practice actually has to do with clearing our five senses. So how we clean our mouth how we oil our nose, how we cleanse our eyes, how we apply oil to the body so that we perceive our reality and our world clearly. And I love that because if you start your day like that, you're sort of setting the foundation, like building a house, you're setting the foundation for the rest of the day. And I actually have like a self-guided one-hour class with a guidebook on the Nacharya that can help folks create their own. Like you can pick and choose like okay, I want to do the eye thing and the skin thing, and that's what I'm going to start with and build that up for yourself because I think it's a really accessible and really powerful practice. I love that. What does your dinacharya look like in this moment of your life? Yeah, right now it looks like waking up. I wake up and I do like a short meditation in bed, and then I go brush my teeth, scrape my tongue, oil my body, And then I drink hot water to start my digestive system. I take the dog for a walk. (laughs) And then I come back and do a meditation practice. Beautiful. The the Vedas knew of the healing powers of walking your dog in the morning. (laughs) (laughs) It's, you know, it's been life-changing, honestly. Like, it's my first dog. And I so love that I have to get out twice a day, like, just – no matter what, I have to walk twice a day every day. It's amazing. Isn't that a gift? I'm like, at the very least, I know that I'll get at least five steps a day. Uh-huh. You know? Yeah. It's it's great. It's great. Yeah. I would love to learn more if you don't mind sharing. And we'll link it in the show notes for people who want to access that one-hour self-guided Dinacharya masterclass that you have. Because I think it is so empowering to say like, These are things that I can do, and I know why they're beneficial. I love the concept of clearing your senses in the morning. And I think you touched on there are different times 
for the different doshas of the day. Could you share a little bit about the full circadian rhythm from wake up, what dosha should be activated in that moment and as the day progresses until we go to sleep? Yeah, yeah. I won't share the whole thing because we'll get overwhelmed, but I'll give a couple. (laughs) So one of the ones that's most important is the transition from dark into light. And so as the sun is rising, we're transitioning from a vata time of day where we should be like kind of deep in our sleep, dreaming, processing into kapha where we should be waking up. And kind of doing the most important things of the day because we have the most energy. It's when we have the most amount of energy in the day. So we want to make sure we take care of ourselves first. And that according to Ayurveda and yoga as well, we want to wake up before the sun rises. Because we want to watch and experience that transition from dark to light. It's so metaphorical. It's so important. And it's the time when we have most sattva or clarity of mind. So it's when we should be doing our reflective practices, our mindfulness practices to set the tone for the day. And then there are two other times of day that are ruled by Vatha, which is about 2 to 5 p.m. in the afternoon and 2 to 5 a.m. in the morning. So oftentimes we think about these as like the two o'clock slump where you want a second cup of coffee Or folks are waking up at 2 a.m. with anxious thoughts. Vata rules both of those times. And that's why that can happen because that kind of wind, that anxiousness of the wind can seep in. So those are the times when it's really important for us to be mindful of that energy, not necessarily indulge it, but help it rest. And I think this is where one of those places where we tend to override our wisdom and we're like, I should take a 20-minute nap and I'm going to have coffee instead. (laughs) <laughs> you know, so being mindful of those both the times of day can really help us kind of manage some of that frenetic energy. The concept of waking up before sunrise, it is so poetic and it also just makes it so much, I think, more intentional to waking up early rather than saying like, I'm part of the 5 a.m. club. I wake up at five, start my day. It's more so like, moving with the natural cycles of our circadian rhythm, the natural cycles of nature, and also in a way, harnessing the energies that are present instead of trying to force things to happen, just riding the momentum of whatever energy is present. And I think that's really, really beautiful. I love yeah. that. Really? Yeah, I love the way that you phrase that because so much of Ayurveda is about returning to the natural world and living within natural cycles. And like we said at the beginning, there's this kind of way of approaching Ayurveda, which becomes a to-do list. But if we're listening more so to the seasons, to the rhythm of the sun and the moon, to circadian rhythms, like we know, our bodies know there's an intuition there already because mm. we're connected There's no way that we're not. That's it. That's it. I would love to hear about from stressed out to stress wise. I think in today's day with the amount of stimuli that we have from work, our cell phones, you know, just everything that's bombarding us, stress is is so prevalent in ways that maybe we don't even realize we're stressed because it's just our default. And so what are some Ayurvedic principles that we can incorporate in stress management and learning how to navigate stress. And yeah, I would love to hear about your perspective on stress, how it pertains to Ayurveda. Yeah. Yeah. So the book is written by myself and two colleagues, uh, my dear friend, Abby, and our colleague, Nikki as well. And it's written primarily for educators to bring practices of yoga, Ayurveda, and mindfulness into the classroom. But honestly, I think the book is great for anybody because we talk about stress IQ, which is this concept of being stress intelligent, like knowing that stress is going to be a part of our lives. So how can we get wise to it? You know, how can we meet stress with wisdom so that when we're in those moments, we can better respond? So from an Ayurvedic perspective, what we talk about a lot in the book is the idea of our enteric nervous system or our gut brain. 
you know, and how our gut and our digestive system is sending signals to the brain through the vagus nerve 10 times more than the other way around. So everything that's going on in our gut is so important for our mental health because often eating the wrong food could actually cause you to feel anxious. And a lot of people don't know that. They don't know that connection. So that's one of the ways. We also bring in a lot of rest practices, like just the importance of rest and reclaiming rest. And you know, I love that this is in the zeitgeist right now because it's so important for us to just acknowledge like we are tired we deserve some rest we got to spend some time in the dream space <laughs> you know the body rejuvenates i can't remember where i heard this it must have been on some podcast but that when you're sleeping your brain is essentially taking a bath like it's cleansed it's being rinsed out and so just like the deep importance of sleep and how we can bring in practices like oiling our feet before bed or drinking a warm cup of tea um, with, you know, nourishing herbs can help us sleep through the night a little bit better. So I would say digestion and sleep are so, so, so important for managing stress. I mean, yeah, those, those two are the biggest levers that are so underutilized, but so easily pulled, you know? Yeah. Like we can, we don't have to worry about all the supplements, all the biohacking. It's like digestion <laughs> and sleep. But yeah, it. start there. Totally. Totally. And movement. Yeah, those yeah. three. Yes, yes. The three pillars. <laughs> Why would somebody oil their feet before bed? So the feet have essentially like the end of all of your meridian points. They're called marma points in Ayurveda. So it connects to the entire body. So and what happens with Vata, this frenetic, windy, butterfly energy, is it tends to move up into the head. And all of our prana, our life force, goes up into the head and we get so busy in thinking. We get so busy in thought. So if we can start to pull some of that prana down by massaging the feet with a warm sesame oil that maybe has some herbs in it, it helps to stimulate the entire body. It brings down the nervous system and it just pulls Vata out of that cloudy space that we can find ourselves in. Mm -hmm. I'm making a mental note of incorporating that into my nighttime practice. That, that just sounds so nourishing, but also I have a lot of vata in my constitution and I'm constantly in, in here. And so <laughs> I need that. Thank you for that. Yeah, of course, the feet and the ears are really important. Mm -hmm. Those two places just help us really kind of calm down. And it's great for children and babies, too. It's a wonderful way to get them to settle. Mm, lovely. Well, I'm so grateful for all your wisdom because you clearly are such a wealth of knowledge. So thank you for spending some time and chatting with us. And I just have one question, and this is more of an open-ended. As the listeners who are we are on our ever quest to growth, transformation, healing. For you as somebody who's walked the healing path for yourself and through helping your clients and your patients, what advice do you have for the listeners who may be struggling with their own health issues and mm -hmm. with that seeking a holistic approach to healing? Mm -hmm. Yeah, this is something that one of my teachers, Claudia Welch, shared with me many years ago that stuck with me. You should always believe you can help. Mm. So as a practitioner, you should always believe you can help. But as an individual, you should always believe there's hope, you know? And I think sometimes when we're on that healing path and it's so overwhelming and you're just like drowning, it's so easy to lose hope mm. that it will change. So I think even in the worst of moments, like there's potential that it will get better. And holding that belief is super rebellious because systems that capitalize off of you being unwell don't want you to know that. Mm -hmm. Thank you for that reminder and for just reminding us to take our power back. And for those listening who I have no doubt will want to connect deeper with you if they're not already connected with you, where can people find you? How can people work with you? Yeah, probably the easiest way to stay in touch is Instagram, which is at Anjali Deva Ayurveda. And then signing up for my newsletter at rootedresa.com. I send out a monthly newsletter with just some sweet 
notes, hopefully sweet notes, and then information about what I'm teaching or offering and ways to stay in touch. Beautiful. Well, Anjali, our time flew. I looked at the clock and I was like, oh my gosh, I could keep talking to her, but I want to honor your time and the listener's time. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you for coming on today and I'll talk to you soon. Yeah. Thank you for the wonderful questions.